um, so that we can um, create effective programs and policies to increase uh, people's well-being and the quality of life. Um, I do want to make it clear that this is just one way to gather this data, and there are many ways you can find out about people's lives and understand uh, people's lived experience. So large-scale surveys is what we're going to be talking about today, but really it's just only one, and we don't want to uh, give the impression that this is the only method, um, though it will be the only method that we're talking about. So um, let me give some instructions for the call. We're going to go through the presentations of each of the three speakers, and then we'll take questions at the end. Um, we are asking people to mute your phone, and you can either do that with whatever mute button you have on your phone, or if you're on the phone, you can sp press star six to mute, and then star seven to unmute. If you're uh, listening to the audio via computer, there should be a little microphone button um, either at the bottom of your screen or at the very top um, with the mute symbol. So during the presentations, if everybody could mute their phone, um, and also if people need to uh, leave the call and then come back, um, we ask that people don't put the call on hold, just hang up and call back into the um, conference. Um, there's also a place on your screen on the left-hand side, um, and you may have to press a button to expand it, where you can send a um, question to myself and to Winston Lahore, who's um, administering the phone conference today. Um, at the end of the uh, uh, presentations, we're going to look to those comments first to see if there are any questions. Usually there are too many questions to be able to answer them all, so uh, I will probably pick and choose amongst the questions to see which ones um, might be most effectively answered by the presenters. Uh, but we're going to wait till the very end because I think often sometimes questions are answered by uh, a comment that might come up later from the presenters. So uh, let me go ahead and just jump into the presentations by introducing the first speaker, Jody Herman. Um, and uh, on your screen, hopefully everybody sees um, a slide that says collecting data about gender identity. Um, and if you don't, um, give us a comment in the chat thing and we'll try to respond to what's going on. But our first speaker is Jody Herman, and she is a scholar here at the Williams Institute. And so, Jody, why don't you go ahead? Great. Thanks, Andrew. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, hi, everyone. It, it's a pleasure to be a part of this webinar today. And as Andrew mentioned, I'm Jody Herman. I'm a scholar at the Williams Institute. And my colleagues and I here at Williams have been engaged in um, research and uh, have hosted several convenings. Um, over the past several years, um, actually probably nearly a decade at this point, um, working on the issue of data collection to identify LGBT people in surveys, um, and particularly large population-based surveys that are designed to be representative of the general population. Um, we've primarily had a U.S. focus in our work, but know that there is work being done all over the world on this type of data collection. And it's our hope to be able to um, network with those who are working on this issue across the globe to advance data collection for LGBT people. Um, my primary focus in my work has been in regard to data collection um, for transgender people and other gender minorities. And today I'll tell you a bit about our work here in the U.S. to create best practices for this data collection and to describe findings from a meeting the Williams Institute convened with uh, researchers and advocates who are working on, a, on this. Uh, topic on, in various parts of the world. Um, so next slide, Winston. Um, there you go. Thank you. Um, so first, I wanted to outline why data collection is important. Um, so data collection helps us to demonstrate the existence of gender minorities. And it helps us to learn about the size and characteristics of the gender minority population. Um, it helps us to increase visibility and it helps destigmatize gender minority people and gender minority communities. Uh, it helps us to understand um, disparities of gender minority populations compared to others and experiences of discrimination and stigma that gender minority people may, uh, may experience. 
Um, and finally, uh, th th there are plenty of, of reasons, but the last one that I'll mention uh, is just that it helps us to inform the development of laws and policies and programs that will impact gender minority people. Next slide, Winston. Thank you. Uh, to help advance the data collection for gender minorities in the United States, um, back in 2011, the Williams Institute convened a group of scholars and advocates to study best practices for asking questions to identify transgender people and other gender minorities in population-based surveys. The group was called the Gender Identity and U.S. Surveillance Group, or GENIUS for short. Uh, the mission of the group was to increase and better understand population-based data about transgender people through the inclusion of gender-related measures on population-based surveys. Um, and to accomplish our mission, we conducted uh, rigorous scientific research on gender-related measures and made recommendations regarding measurement research and data collection. Um, and so uh, here I just want to acknowledge the steering committee and uh, members of the group that worked on this uh, multi-year project. And next slide. Thank you. Um, so the group had to grapple with many considerations in doing this work with a focus on creating recommendations that would work on surveys that would be distributed to the general population. So they had to be questions that everyone could understand and answer correctly. Um, Greta will talk a lot more about this in a bit, but um, the two main considerations that we had were to correctly identify people who are not gender minorities as not being a gender minority. So, for instance, identify cisgender people as cisgender and not transgender. And also to correctly identify gender minority respondents as gender minorities. So, for example, uh, identify transgender people as transgender and not cisgender. So these were our two main considerations. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so in the end, we made recommendations for several measures that worked well when we tested them in a, in a couple different studies. Um, where two questions can be asked in a survey, we recommend a two-step measure that asks about a person's sex assigned at birth and how they describe themselves in regard to gender now. So the responses to these questions can then be cross-tabulated to identify those respondents whose gender identity differs from their sex assigned at birth. The next slide. Um, so we also recommended a question that had been administered in Massachusetts as part of their statewide survey for the CDC's behavior risk factor surveillance system. This question is designed to identify respondents who themselves identify as transgender and um, also identify whether they are trans women, trans men, or gender nonconforming. Uh, a similar question has been adopted by 20 plus states for their behavior risk factor surveillance system surveys, which is great. We've been able to use that data to study the um, demographics and experiences of trans people in those states. Um, so for the, the genius recommended measures that we did a, a final report where all the measures are available and that was published in September 2014, and it's available on the Williams Institute website. The next slide. So uh, during that time, uh, we became aware of data collection efforts outside of the United States, and um, under Andrew Park's leadership, we eventually worked to convene a meeting of researchers and advocates who are working on data collection in various parts of the globe. Um, so this coalesced in a meeting last June in Amsterdam uh, as part of the WPATH conference. And we had three goals for the meeting. So first was to develop a network of academics and other experts who study the collection of data about gender minorities. Uh, second was to determine the desirability and feasibility of developing a set of international best practices for the collection of data about gender minorities. Um, and finally, consider um, what, an international, what an international best practices model might look like and determine what additional considerations and steps are needed before beginning to develop these best practices. Next slide. Um, so we convened this group with the assistance of a steering committee. And through the steering committee and tapping into our existing networks, we had um, plus the steering committee, 20 uh, scholars and advocates join us at the meeting. Of course, this group was limited in the sense that uh, these were individuals who um, were able to uh, 
identify, who we were able to identify through our steering committee and networks and also would be attending the WPATH conference. So it was clear to the group that there were many people who were not in the room at the meeting who should be in the room. Um, but nevertheless, we engaged in a conversation to explore the topics I just outlined while acknowledging these and other limitations of the discussion. Um, and all of this is described in a report, um, a report from the meeting that's also available online at the Williams Institute website. Next slide. Thank you. So um, meeting participants submitted information about gender identity data collection activities that they were aware of that were part of official government efforts of some sort. Um, and this slide is just a summary of the information that they provided. I won't go through each of these, but they are all described in more detail in the report. Um, but clearly, uh, many parts of the world are not included here, such as the entirety of Africa. Um, but this does speak to the fact that these activities are going on in a variety of locations and governments are interested in this type of data collection. Next slide. Um, so we considered whether it was desirable and feasible to establish international best practices for gender identity data collection. And there were many nuances to this discussion, which are outlined in the report. Um, but these are the main takeaways from that discussion. Um, best practices are desirable in order to provide guidance for those who are interested in engaging in gender identity data collection. Uh, it would be desirable to have some comparability in measures that are being used across countries. Um, it would also be a way to hold governments accountable in regards to their gender minority populations. But could international best practices act possibly be feasible? Um, the group consensus was that, yes, this is fe feasible with these considerations. Um, the development of best practices needs to involve gender minority communities and the safety of the members of these communities needs to be accounted for in that process. Um, there are also cross-cultural considerations, which we'll hear a little bit more about later. Um, and so no one measure will likely work everywhere. And that there must be institutional support for the efforts. The next slide. So the group recommended that governments and international institutions engage in and provide support for collection of data about gender minorities and data analysis. Um, consider the inclusion and active participation of gender minority communities in the process of supporting data collection and analysis. And um, governments and international institutions should consider the safety of gender minorities when considering uh, and conducting this type of data collection and analysis. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll just wrap up by um, pointing you to our website where both of the reports I mentioned are posted and, uh, and they are free to download. And um, now I will uh, turn it back over to Andrew. Thank yep. you. Thanks, Jody. Um, so our next speaker um, is Greta Bauer from Western University. She's one of the um, leading global scholars in this issue and has done a lot of work on um, trying to figure out the, the, what is effective between the many different ways we could approach this issue. So, uh, Greta? Hey, thank you, Andrew. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you today. So I'm going to be talking about issues. I want to go back. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Eleven years ago, when we started the community-based TransPulse project, there were almost no quantitative data on trans people, and we heard really loud and clear from community how much this was needed. People said, I'm one of the walking dead because we're not counted, we're not represented anywhere. And they talked about erasure as being something that everybody was familiar with. So I feel that while we've come a long ways in doing community-based research and gathering data from trans communities specifically, um, as Andrew had mentioned, these kind of data are different, and we're not necessarily able to document inequalities in the way that we need to. And that's what we're talking about now. Next slide. So I'm going to be drawing on two sources. One is the meeting that we had last year in Amsterdam that Jody mentioned and issues that were brought up in that. And the other is issues that emerged in an analysis that we did here for a mixed methods paper that was published last month in PLOS One. And this is based on um, 311 people who completed two sets of surveys and then 79 people who did cognitive interviews. So that's a maximum diversity sample of Canadian residents of 14 to 77 years. And we were looking at these kind of measures in a Canadian 
context. So it's a settler colonial context. We have indigenous communities and indigenous genders. It's multicultural. About one in five people is an immigrant and a larger proportion are first generation. We're an officially bilingual country that's functionally multilingual. And um, we have a lot of uh, people whose English or French speaking is um, not their first language. And we have generational language differences. So what we did in this is we wanted to evaluate two different sets of measures. The first is a multidimensional sex gender measure that was designed for the Ontario Health Study, which is a cohort study of more than 200,000 Ontarians. And for this, um, we added a screener question to their initial question, do you consider yourself to be trans? And for anybody who checked yes or don't know, they got a set of follow-up questions. Turn on the next slide. And so they got a lot more detail, that small group. Um, sex assigned at birth, your gender identity, your lived gender, and also hormones or surgeries, because this again was looking at long-term cancer and cardiovascular disease risk. For the second uh, set of questions on the next slide, we uh, used a two-step measure. Go to the next slide, thank you very much. Uh, we used a, a two-step question that was in the, the Genius Report that Jody talked about. This was the one that was identified as a promising measure that needed further testing, so we wanted to test that out. And it had these response options for gender identity, male and female, and then transversions, and then gender queer, gender nonconforming, or other please specify, followed by the sex assigned at birth question. Next slide. So I'm just going to list out some of the issues that came up either in, in discussions in Amsterdam or in this research. Sensitivity of questions, would people answer or would they skip? Potential confusion for cisgender participants who might overwhelm the smaller transgender group if they were misclassified. Number of questionnaire items required, knowing the efficiency that's needed in some of these studies and difficulty of introducing new questions. Which dimensions of sex and gender are captured? Transness versus trans identity knowing that not all trans people identify as trans. What would capture the largest number of trans people? Gender non-conforming versus non-binary versus trans. Who are we getting? Who are we not getting? Um, capturing cultural gender identities, where people might not identify under some newer terminology. Uh, Self-report versus proxy reporting. We were assuming self-report, but we wanted to also look at whether our study informed issues for proxy reporting. And translatability, English as a second language issues or other language learning issues, and stability of terminology since trans-specific language is changing rapidly. And lastly, um, what the implications are for a move away from self-reported uh, self data to administrative censuses. Next slide. So to allay anybody's concerns, uh, we didn't find any problem with missings. And I think this is consistent with other research that has evaluated these measures. They're not that sensitive. People are worried about it. Many more people skip questions on income and other types of demographic measures. Next slide. There was also no major confusion on these questions from our cisgender participants, either set of questions that we evaluated. And two thirds of our cognitive interview participants were cisgender. So I'm gonna focus the rest of the talk primarily on what we learned from the trans participants. But, but these were very easy. Even if people didn't know the word transgender, they knew it wasn't them. And with the two-step question, they sometimes found it redundant, but they were able to answer it. Next slide. So researchers often, so trans community surveys, people often want open-ended questions or a lot of different options. In, in population data, people often want to just add one other option or expand their male-female question. Um, this doesn't necessarily work. And so we looked at our trans-masculine and our trans-feminine participants. Um, we found that in each of those groups, a sizable proportion checked each of these options. So they're not going to necessarily identify as something else, if that's what a researcher is expecting. But at the same time, the ones who we did cognitive interviews with were really doing a lot of work trying to figure out what the researchers were asking. You know, did we want their sex assigned at birth? Did we want their gender? And they came to different conclusions about that. Next slide. So while well, an other option opens up some flexibility, we can't expect that this is going to capture trans participants. Uh, one laughed about it being a, a gender trinary rather than a gender binary. And um, we're not going to be able to identify a gender spectrum based on that. So in our view, we need at least two questions to do this well. This also demonstrated that trans people are not necessarily going to check an other or a trans option. So here's a quote from one of our participants who says that he recognizes that he's transitioned, but it's just not part of his identity. If push came to shove, maybe he would let someone know, but it's his medical history. It's not his identity. Next. <laughs> 
with both of these measures, when we looked at classification into that broader group of trends, they actually had a really strong agreement. They both functioned very well in this regard. So if you look here, um, each number is a participant, and those blue cells that run on the diagonal are the ones that are in agreement between the two sets of measures. And you'll see almost everybody's in there. And the ones who aren't, there's often just one person in a category with one exception. It's the cell that has seven people in. And those were seven individuals who were classified as non-binary assigned female at birth on the two-step, but as cis women in the uh, multidimensional measure. Next slide. When we looked at those individuals, they were all people who were assigned female, they were all queer women, and they had all checked the option for gender queer or gender nonconforming. And this option, importantly, didn't say transgender. One of the other um, versions that Jody had given said transgender. Uh, and then had a non-conforming option. So these people all were very clear they weren't transgender. And when we interviewed them, they weren't transgender, they weren't non-binary, but it was the gender non-conforming part that they were reacting to in this. So I think this is a bit of a caution with regard to wording that you know, we need to consider whether we want to capture a very broad group of people who might be gender conforming, but not non-binary per se. Next slide. We looked at potential issues with regard to proxy reporting, even though we were testing a self-reported measure, and people did talk about things like not being out to their family. So this participant uh, has a very religious family and says that it's problematic, and so it's easier for them to just identify as female, even though they identify as genderqueer. And when asked specifically if they were out to their family, they said no, that they were not. One issue that came up in our study that hasn't come up in other studies is, um, is traditional indigenous identities. And so this participant identifies as two-spirited and wanted to make a point that it's, it's something more gender fluid, more than gender fluid, it's something a little bit different, and in fact it's kind of a different paradigm. And in later consultations that we did with Indigenous colleagues in shaping our recommendations, people felt very strongly that there needed to be an option for Indigenous and cultural genders that's included because people might not identify with words like non-binary that are seen as new or perhaps trendy and kind of different from long-standing traditional genders. Um, even if they were going to be merged in analysis, they felt like they needed to be listed separately. And so um, one of our conclusions was that traditional identities are a different paradigm. Next slide. Uh, another thing that came up was the issue of whether non-binary people are in fact trans. And so I like these two quotes. Actually, they're more interesting if they're even longer, but this is a short talk. So um, these people are both identify as genderqueer uh, from opposite sides of Canada, both in their 40s. One says they're trans and one says they're not. But if you look at everything that they said, the one thing that they really agreed on is that not everybody understands non-binary as being included in trans the way they do or excluded from trans the way that they do. So I think as researchers, we need to make really clear where we're placing non-binary people and make this clear for them and to understand that some will identify as trans and some will not. Next slide. Uh, so what we wanted to look to at, um, or have researchers really think about what dimensions of sex and gender they were capturing. So this isn't meant to be an exhaustive list. It's from a chapter that I wrote a few years ago to kind of help guide researchers. And so you can see here a two-step measure really captures two of these things. It captures gender identity and sex assigned at birth. And by cross-tabulating, you can then get the category in the upper left column, whether somebody falls under the trans umbrella, whether they identify as trans or not. So in, in some studies, we're going to actually want additional data. Um, on, on hormones or on whether somebody's at risk for particular kinds of cancer. We may want to know live gender if we're looking at people's risk of, of being um, subjected to violence, for example, whether they're living in their gender is going to play a role in their targetability for, um, for those type of acts of violence. Next slide. So when we took our data and we looked at those who were classified as trans under a two-step measure by gender spectrum, and then we looked at the other measures that we had, um, you can see that uh, whether somebody's classified as trans under a broad two-step measure is not necessarily going to be a good proxy for different dimensions of gender. And in fact, it's going to be, uh, it's going to function different as a proxy depending on whether people are on the transmasculine spectrum, so trans men or non-binary people who are assigned female or they're on the trans feminine spectrum. And so in those cases, if it's really important to know those things, we're going to want to ask them. So you want to think about that with regard to the purpose of the, the survey instrument that's being designed and how it's going to be used. Next slide. 
So in the end, in a Canadian context, we recommended a version of a two-step question with one follow-up question and then additional optional add-ins. And what we were trying to do here is to keep the language really simple so that it could be translatable between English and French in particular because everything that we do is in those two languages, even though we were testing in English, but also could be translated into other languages. We also wanted it to be understandable for people for whom this is not their first language. And we wanted it to be stable over time. So you can see here, for example, in the second question on gender identity, um, specifics are put in for example, so that if those change over time, if in five years we're not using non-binary any longer, we can change the for examples without changing the basic response for the question. Um, sim similarly, if we're doing this in French, we can put French options in for example or in other languages which might be not direct translations of English options. So what we went with was sex assigned at birth followed by current gender identity and asking which best describes to acknowledge that this might not be how someone personally identifies. An optional add-in is an open-ended question after that where somebody can write in their gender identity. We didn't do it as an other please specify because in our study and in other studies that I've done and colleagues have done, uh, write-ins will not always be classifiable. So people will write in, for example, that their gender identity is human or just me or gay or other things that don't allow you to classify. We recommend that for those who don't choose male-male, if we could go back, or female-female, that they be asked a third question on what gender they live as in their day-to-day -day life. And this is important. We were thinking of some of the surveys that we do here that look at violence, for example, that if we look at the broader group of trans people, we might actually underestimate the levels of violence experienced by people who are living in their gender, since a pretty significant proportion of people who know that they're trans are not living in their gender. Next slide. And then it had that there's a couple of other optional add-ins on hormones and on um, surgeries, and we ask that people ask those of cisgender participants as well who may have had the same kind of procedures for other reasons. So hopefully I've covered everything on this slide, all the things that we considered anticipated, confusion, avoiding unnecessary options for sex assigned at birth, um, recognizing the distinctiveness of indigenous genders. We didn't differentiate between, for example, men and trans men or women and trans women because some of our participants really felt strongly that they were being asked to choose a lesser version of being a man or a woman by giving the trans option. So nobody felt it was really important to have those. Some people felt that it was problematic to have them. And I think I've covered everything else here, except that it's not suitable for proxy reporting in most cases. Next slide. And one additional consideration I'd like to add before I wrap up is that within the next 10 years or so in Canada, we're looking at moving to administrative census, so stopping uh, data collection from individuals. We're already doing this by incorporating tax data into the census instead of using self-report data. So we need to think as researchers, if we're going to be using these kinds of data, what happens when we move from self-report to linking and merging together these other data sources? And how are we capturing sex and gender data in those? And how will those be shared? How will those be linked? And how will those be used? So I want to leave that on everybody's plate too as a forward-looking question for the future beyond survey design. Next slide. And I want to thank my colleagues who co-authored um, this work with me and everybody who had input into um, helping to design the recommended questions and giving us feedback on it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Greta. Uh, this is really important information. And I want to let people know that we will be putting um, a page on the web, on the um, Williams web page with references to the various studies that have been referred to and also the slides. Um, so our next presentation is Angelo Brandelli Costa, and um, uh, Angelo attended the meeting, and he is also engaging in pretty cutting-edge research in Brazil. And so he is the one that's going to take all the information that's, and the theoretical and, and framework information that you've heard and uh, walk through how it's been applied and how he has resolved some of the questions that have been raised in the context of his project. So, Angelo? Uh, Andrew, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm really glad to be here to speak with you about the projects uh, we did in Brazil. I'm a researcher from Southern Brazil, uh, working with psychology and discrimination and prejudice in the, uh, the point of view of the aggressors, but also in the point of view of the victims, mainly uh, related to health outcomes. I also work in a transgender clinic uh, in the University of Hospital that is uh, doing gender affirmation procedures since uh, 1998. This is going to be important for 
the context of where this research took place. So next slide, please. I'm going to uh, introduce you to some aspects of the Brazilian context in order to, to, to understand a little bit more about the research we did here. So the first thing you need to know about Brazil is that the transgender term, this idea of an umbrella term that can encompass the gender diversity that is, uh, I think, widespread in the Anglophone world, is not very used here in Brazil. So uh, we, we have a community, a trans community, that prefer to refer as travesti, that is a culture-specific gender identity. I'm going to uh, take a look about this in a moment. Transsexual or trans men and women. And a travesti, this culture-specific gender identity, uh, is a person that was assigned birth uh, assigned male at birth, identify as man, sometimes as women, sometimes as travesty as a third gender, but a form of the female gender, and typically not undergo to gender uh, genital modification. So it's a, a different gender identity that, and this is an issue uh, when you do quantitative research uh, here in Brazil. So I just want you to know that this research that we are doing here happened in the context where those identities are not completely settled among those communities, and some researchers believe that it's not possible to quantify this process, that gender identity in Brazil is something that could be only addressed qualitatively, so that's not the case. Uh, another thing that must be addressed about Brazil is that we have uh, the world's largest gay pride in the world. The, next, the last one that happened days ago uh, reunited three million people in Sao Paulo, but next slide, please. We also have the largest number of transgender uh, murder worldwide. So, uh, you, you can see here that South America is leading the number of murder of transgender individuals, but you can see that the next slide, please, that Brazil is the first country in absolute numbers and the third in relative numbers. This data came from newspaper monitoring about, about murder of transgender individuals and also by the NGOs monitoring. You don't have official data about this in Brazil so far, but you can see that it's a very, a very rash scenario. Next slide, please. Regarding the legal framework of this research conducted in Brazil, we don't have so far any anti-discrimination law to, LGBT, to protect LGBT communities. Uh, legal and gender recognition in Brazil uh, is related to uh, mandatory uh, surgeries, genital surgeries. This is not being discussed, the modification of this. It's possible uh, by uh, in legal terms, let's say, but you need to do a genital modification surgery so far. But our public health care system covers hormone therapy and, me and medical gender affirmation procedures such, such as genital surgeries. We have some clinics in Brazil. One is here in my state. In, we have four more, the other one in Sao Paulo, and the, our research took place in those two states. We're going to sue my state in Sao Paulo in the southeast. Next slide, please. So in 2013, I went to Montreal to attend a meeting that discussed the use of internet and how intervention among LGBT communities in Canada. And I, I got in touch with the TransPulse project in that meeting, and we decided to implement the same methodology here in Brazil. So we started discussing with the healthcare practitioners that work with transgender uh, people here in Brazil and also with transgender communities, how to uh, reframe the TransPulse project uh, using Brazilian, Brazilian culture specific uh, trans identities, but also the healthcare needs and access barriers that communities here face uh, trying to assess um, healthcare. So we produced a survey based on the trans pulse with input of those communities, and we end up, next slide, with a 122 question survey divided into 12 sections regarding demographics, parentality and conjugality, healthcare needs and access barriers, hormone treatment, body modification procedures, HIV and SDIs. Uh, sexual health, prejudice and discrimination, housing, work and income, substance use and well-being. I'm going to talk about a little bit more about this, those in green, but mainly about demographics because that's where the gender assessment is. Please, next slide, please. So we use the two-step uh, method question. We first ask sex assigned at birth. So at birth, you were assigned as male or female. And the second question was, which of the following best describe your current gender identity? So women, men, trans women, trans men, travis she, or other. Different from Canada, the communities here wanted to mark the trans identity politically, but also as a way to visibilize some of the way people used to classify themselves here. And also, they want to visibilize the culture specific travis she identity. We use the open-ended other question, and we face some issues. I'm going to talk a little bit more. Greta already addressed some, but I'm going to talk a little bit more later. So next slide, please. The data collection happened in two phases. The first one was a hospital-based 
data collection in those two states uh, here in the map, Rio Grande do Sul and São Paulo, in the hospitals that provided gender affirmation procedures. And we also use a Facebook ad with the help of the, the NGOs and transgender uh, personalities here in Brazil that helped us to disseminate the ad uh, in those two states in the internet. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit of the demographics of the sample. The mean age was 26 years old. The race, race ethnic background matches those from the states we are investigating. The educational background, no. We have 20% of you know, people with tertiary degree, but in Brazil is somehow like 10%, so it's a very high educated sample. Uh, and if we split a hospital and internet, you can, we can also see that this is, uh, this is true for the hospital. So it's uh, interesting to see maybe that uh, high education is something important to access healthcare in Brazil. Right now, we discussed this in an article I'm going to show you later. So we have a, a final sample of 710 transgender individuals. Uh, those are the two states. The first one is São Paulo, the hospital data collection 47, the internet 429, Rio Grande do Sul 51, 883. Next slide, please. This, those are the included, the, the included participants. I'm going to talk about the excluded participants later on. So the first question, gender assigned at birth, 65% uh, assigned male at birth, 35 assigned female at birth. Next slide, please. Those are the gender identities we, we use to, to investigate. Our population, trans women, 25%, just women, 20, uh, 22%, travesty, trans men, men, and other, 8%. Next slide. We cross-code those gender identities in, in categories that we use for the analysis uh, to, uh, of the healthcare needs and access barriers, mental health outcomes. So we use trans woman. We put travesty in the trans woman's uh, super category, also due to the input of the communities. Trans men and the other uh, split it as assigned female or assigned male. The next slide, please. So we had 1,361 uh, respondents and just 710 entering our, our, sample, our survey. I'm going to uh, show you how we use the exclusion criteria. Next slide. We differentiate a, a sex assigned at, at birth, gender assigned at birth, and assi those assigned male that's, and that currently identify as men, and those assigned female that, that currently assigned as, as women. Those were excluded for a survey. And we needed to do a more qualitative approach to the other category, as Greta just mentioned. People that answer gay, human, simply me, or people that answer things like, I consider myself a female, but people in the street use, it, use masculine pronouns and refer to me as a man. And we need to think about if you want to include or not include those persons, uh, depending on the kind of analysis we need to do. So the open-ended other category uh, requires a more qualitative look to see uh, whether we're going to include some, some of those persons or not. For example, we, we had a, a lots of persons say, well, I'm a very masculine lesbian woman or I'm a very effeminate gay man. And we need to see if this enters uh, this idea of trans that you are working with or not. Next slide, please. So I'm going to show you some of the, research, the results of our, our surveys. This data regarding mental health is still in production. The articles are still in production. We were able to measure depression and self-esteem with Rosenberg self-esteem scale. You can see the cut points for depression and low self-esteem in trans women, trans men, and the other categories quite high. Uh, also, we measure suicide ideation and suicide attempts. You can see that it's 60% it's for trans women. It's almost 70% for trans men. The other, in the other category, 60 is 67%. Uh, we also asked if it was, if it was a trans related suicide ideation or suicide attempt. You can see the majority of persons said yes. And comparing to the Brazilian um, surveillance of uh, suicide attempts and ideation, you can see that ideation is four times higher attempts, 14.5 times higher. So we, we were able to show this for the first time in the Brazilian context. We also investigated trans related violence. We, you can see that we asked about what kind of violence people were exposed due to the fact that they were trans, physical intimidation and threats, verbal harassment, sexual har harassment, silent harassment, physical as violence and sexual assault. We also asked where those violence took place. You can see the majority happened in the street. This is completely different from the surveillance of uh, violence in the general population that used to happen in the household or family. So this is related to discrimination, of course. 86% of the people that responded to our survey said it experienced one of those, one of those violence. And you can see only 10% reported to the police. So the, the surveillance of this data in Brazil so far must be very, very bad. Next slide, please. 
Here we, this is the data we are producing now for, for, one, um, for an article. My group, that's the impact of violence in suicide attempt and ideation. You can see when we are excluding um, those types of violence, physical and uh, sexual assault, verbal harassment and threat, and no harassment or, or assault, uh, this have a major impact on suicide ideation and suicide attempt, lowering those, those mental health outcomes. Next slide, please. And here we also ask about how, we also ask if, if those persons ever consulted a mental health provider. You can see the majority never consulted a mental health provider. And we also ask for those who consulted uh, those mental health providers, they were satisfied. And you can see that the other category, gender non-binary, agender, or queer, a person that identifies as queer, those are, the most un, those are the most unsatisfied about the mental health consultation we need to do. So a lot of things to do here in Brazil regarding the discussion about gender diversity within mental health care providers. Next slide, please. And this is another data that we produced regarding to avoidance of health care when needed and health care discrimination. So we asked people if they ever avoided health care when needed due to the fact that they were trans. 43.2% said yes. We also asked about several scenarios uh, of discrimination in the healthcare context that emerged uh, in, the con in the context with different gender communities here in Brazil. One of the scenarios, for example, is uh, the healthcare provided avoided to touch me due to the fact that I am trans and other scenarios like this. 62% said yes to one of those scenarios. And you can see here that the past discrimination impacts uh, avoidance of healthcare when needed due to the fact that this, the person is trans. This data is already published, next slide please, in this article uh, in the Journal of Immigrant and Minority Health. You can take a look at more details if you want to. Next slide please. So uh, I want to introduce you to the, the kind of the analysis and data collection we are doing right now in Brazil, trying to address some of the issues that the other presenters uh, show to you uh, in the culture, in a, a context that is culturally diverse from the United States and Canada, we were successful to assess gender identity, even in a context where those identities are not completely established in the communities. It, it was not something that harmed those communities. We had a, a lot of uh, positive input from uh, people that answer our, our survey. So the two-step question method worked in Brazil and is something that should be used uh, in cultural, culturally different contexts. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Angela. I think that for particularly for people on the call who don't do research design uh, full time, your presentation showed how decisions to measure and categorize respondents at the very beginning does affect the structure of the analysis and the results throughout. Um, although on another level, no matter how you categorize people, it's it's uh, it paints a, a fairly um, bad picture of experience um, as a transgender person of travesty in Brazil. But um, So we have a few questions, and we've got um, a good amount of time to, to answer those questions. And the first question um, is for Jody. And uh, Jody, if you could press star seven and unmute. And the question is, can you elaborate what you mean by safety with regard to the data collection process? What what are the safety concerns and, and how are they addressed? Um, sure. So the discussion at the meeting was about uh, certain um, certain countries and contexts in where uh, disclosing someone's status as a gender minority might actually put them in to um, you know potential danger, harm, or the subject of discrimination. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, if data collection were taking place uh, in, uh, say, a particular country or a particular area of a country where um, you know, gender minority people may be a particularly vulnerable to uh, violence, harassment, or discrimination, that considerations for um, you know, anonymity, data security, those types of things should be taken into consideration um, I believe some at, at the meeting even discussed the possibility of not wanting to do data collection at all in those types of contexts. Um, but I'll also uh, let uh, Greta and um, 
Oh, Greta might recall from that discussion or Angelo, other concerns that were brought up in regard to safety and security. Do either of you have anything to add on that? And Greta and Angela, go ahead and press star seven to unmute if you want to answer those questions. Okay. My audio actually just cut out and I just rejoined, so I missed what you said, Jody. Okay, the, the wow. question is uh, what were some of so, the uh, considerations regarding safety for gender minority communities in regards to data collection? I think it was just a lot about physical safety, that uh, if we're at areas where people are at risk of physical violence, that it's not safe, or where they're at risk of even employment discrimination, it's not safe. Yeah. Um, here, why, uh, why don't we let Greta off the hook? Because um, she didn't hear the far, uh, uh, first part of that. Um, and let me actually move to another question. Um, and uh, this is for, it's directed towards Greta, but I think anybody can answer. Um, what are the thoughts about the use of the term gender minority versus transgender um, that is the use of the term in a community setting when we refer to conversationally uh, the community what terms should be used and how stable are they and when we do that and, and use the term to refer to a community when that community may use different terms to refer to itself how should we sort ourselves out of that um, potential predicament? Okay, I have a couple of thoughts on that, and then I think other people probably will want to add in because a lot of this is actually very location specific. So I think as researchers, we need to make really clear that when we're talking about a group that we've categorized, we're not implying that everybody in that group identifies with that. So I've seen people slip from a broad definition of trans into talking about trans identified participants, even though those people may not actually identify as trans. So we need to be really cautious that when we're grouping people together into these large groups, we're collapsing a lot of different individual identity. So with regard to trans or transgender versus gender minority, um, gender minority and in fact minority of any kind from Canada is, is a fairly American kind of thing because a lot of that came out of civil rights movement era and a lot of uh, it's a lot of kind of political stuff behind this this idea of minority groups and so that language is used in Canada but not with the frequency or not in the same way. I think gender minority is nice as a research term in a sense because it captures a large group of people regardless of changing definitions and it works well cross-culturally when we're talking as researchers because there are different gender minority identities in different groups. I think it's not language that community generally uses to refer to themselves. Um, in Canada, if we go back to you know, a decade, 12 years ago, whenever we were putting together the Trans Pulse project, in the US, the umbrella term at the time was very much transgender. In Canada, we went with trans at that point before a lot of other people had started using it because after a lot, lot of debate, it was the, the least offensive term to the most people. And we still use trans pretty heavily. But I think you just need to really know the language of the communities that you're working with and make sure you differentiate between individual identity and a research created group term. Angela or Jody, any additional comments? I agree with this. This is uh, very important in the, in the context like Brazil where transgender is not used for, uh, by the community. So we need to understand exactly what kind of term the transgender community is using here in Brazil. And we can use transgender as a, as a scientific researcher term to communicate internationally. And regarding to safety, uh, this was also an issue in Brazil, it's related to the idea to mark some of the group as trans and uh, another part of the group as just men or women, because uh, in Brazil, in another context, some people want to move completely to other gender and do not mark the trans uh, identity. Uh, and if we visibilize this somehow in a form or in a, in a, somehow in a, in a kind of data collection for, in a hospital or a health clinic, not in a national wide data collection, this could visibilize the trans status to the partner to the family, to, I don't know, like this could be generate some uh, security issues to this person. So that's why it's important to encompass here in Brazil, uh, the trans identity and also 
simply men and women, but using uh, the terms that community wants you to, to use to describe themselves. But this is moving quickly, so we need to be cautious and to, to talk to the community and to understand how they are using those terms. Yeah, this is Jody. I I don't really have much to to add to um, what Greta and Angelo have already said. I agree. I, I agree with what they've said. I think there's differences in in whether or not you're conducting research in a in a um, small community based setting and uh, you know should should you know work with the terminology that's being used in that context and then having these larger kind of um, international discussions where there really is no one set way of talking about gender. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's definitely just something to be mindful of. And I think that uh, um, folks have been trying to use gender minority to, to handle all that complexity and in, in, uh, under a very broad term. Um, we have a question about the participation of cisgender people in surveys. Um, and I think both Jody and Greta mentioned that there are concerns that cisgender people may not understand the question that's being asked. And if there are um, many errors among the cisgender population, given that that population is so much larger, that could really mess up the results for if you're seeking to identify non-cisgender people. So um, Greta, could you describe in your study the cisgender people that that evidently had an understanding um, uh, are there any patterns within the cisgender population of who understands what they're being asked best? Is it younger, older people mixed uh, you know I think the, the the person who asked the question said urban hip or older rural or yeah okay, so I would actually reframe that a little bit because they don't need to understand it. I think what's important is to have questions that cisgender people don't need to understand. They just need to know that it's not them. So as an example, we had interviewed a, a man in his 70s. He was a white heterosexual farmer, I believe, um, from out west. And you know, he was kind of laughing about the questions. He's like, I, I don't know what this is. There are so many identities these days. In my day, it was so much simpler. But he knew it wasn't him, and he could check that, no, he was not transgender. So I think we need to have questions that people don't need to fully understand to classify themselves correctly, and that's the key. Because if we depend on true understanding, then we're going to see those kind of differences that you're asking about. And I, yeah, I'd agree with, with Greta uh, on that for sure. Um, we spent a lot of time in the genius group making sure that we were uh, – Try, that our, our research, sometimes we called it how, the How to Not Confuse Cisgender People Project because we were very concerned about having just a handful of cisgender people um, misclassifying themselves and how that would flood the category of transgender people that, that we were trying to create. So um, one way that a couple of surveys have dealt with this, which if you have some flexibility, might be an option. Uh, with the California Health Interview Survey, they um, adopted the two-step measure, and it's an interviewer-administered survey over the phone. And so they have um, they have the ability to, when the two-step uh, question is asked, if somebody's gender identity differs from their sex assigned at birth, it triggers for the interviewer a confirmation question that ask them to confirm their responses to prior answers. And um, the trans identity question in the CDC's uh, behavior risk factor surveillance system does have a follow-up question asking people to be more specific about their gender identity. And so to me, that kind of serves as a confirmation question. Um, but in our studies that we did in the genius group, we didn't we didn't really find that that cis people were had any particular confusion. Uh, you know, like Greta said, they knew who they were and they knew who they were not, and that was sufficient. Um, I, like Greta said, some felt that the question, the two-step measure, was redundant. They're just asking the same thing over again. Um, so we we really haven't seen that be much of a problem. Um, and uh, and I think this might 
unfortunately be the last question we can take because uh, there are several others that have been sent in. <clears throat> this is um, from uh, Mark Lachance. Uh, the question is, should we focus on lived gender rather than gender identity, uh, given the relationship shown in the Brazilian survey, that is, the relationship between gender and violence? And I guess I would take it further. Um, when you know that the purpose of your study is to look at, say, health, um, or something biological versus violence or something social. Um, in violence, the socially assigned gender, that is the gender that people perceive that you are, may be even more important a determinant of violence than your gender identity. So wh wh when should you look at which? We all, I just get, gave you a, a snapshot of the data that we have, but we also have questions regarding trans uh, passability of, or how much the person is, um, is perceived to be trans without uh, saying that, and about uh, other questions regarding expression of gender. So in the, the, the paper we are uh, writing right now on the impact of violence and mental health, we are taking this uh, into we are also looking at this as well. So it's important to have other measures of gender expression rather than gender identity to see this impact of violence on mental health, of course. And but so I, how, I how did you ask about trans passability? We asked, uh, we used uh, uh, the same question that a trans pulse, the trans pulse used is, that is, uh, uh, in what frequency do you are perceived as trans without uh, having to say, without saying anything about it? is a question that dealt with this aspect. It's frequency regarding transpassability. Yeah. Um, comments from Jody or Greta? I think in trans community surveys, we can ask a lot of detailed questions that you're not going to get space for in a large population survey. And mm -hmm. so I think you know, Angelo, in an Angelo's study or in TransPulse, we had just a huge range of questions we could look at. So in a large survey where you're trying to figure out um, you may have to trade off one thing versus the other. I know in a, in a lot of our studies, we might have 50% of the broader group of trans people who are actually living full time in their gender. Um, and another quarter, third who are living part time in their gender or go back and forth and then maybe 20% that aren't or something like that. So I, I think it's a question of who's the, who's the base group that you want to be able to extrapolate to, right? So the advantages of looking at gender identity is you get the broadest group of trans people and even trans people who aren't out and aren't living in their gender are experiencing oftentimes a lot of psychological distress from that very situation. If you include both lived gender and gender identity, you can actually cross-classify those groups and see who's out and living in their gender and who's not. You could actually explore that even further. Whereas for something like violence, it's living in your gender. And then also, if you had another question, that targetability question would add to that as well. So my concern with the, the lived gender is that if, if we're just getting that broader group, that we might dilute out the effect for what's happening for other groups within trans community. So if, if a high proportion of people who are living in their gender are experiencing violence, but if only 50% are living in their gender full time, we dilute it out when we're looking at everybody who, who is trans based on gender identity. And so I, I don't want to see us underestimate really significant harms that are happening to groups of people in the population. So I guess everybody has to weigh that out based on the aims of a particular data collection instrument. Um, Jody, I'm going to wrap up unless you have something. Yeah, no, I, I, I would just, uh, I agree with, with uh, everything that Greta and Angelo had to say on that. Thanks. Yep. Um, I want to say that there's lots of questions that uh, we've gotten that remain unanswered, and I apologize for not being able to do that. Um, I also want to say that the attendance on this call has been greater than any other call we've had, so much so that we've um, exceeded the capacity of the ReadyTalk server. Um, and for a topic that many people would find, you know, kind of a technical, insighty thing, uh, I think it's very significant that there's this level of interest in it because this is a topic that does, I think, guide not only researchers but um, policy from the community level up to um, global and, and uh, you know, international policy. So I want to thank everybody, and I especially want to thank um, the speakers for preparing the presentation and giving us this information. Uh, and obviously there's more questions. We're going to continue this conversation, um, hopefully with everybody that's on the call. And uh, I think by 
say next week we'll have stuff up on the website so that you can um, follow up with additional references. So um, thank you, Jody and Greta and Angelo, and, um, and goodbye, everybody.